My name, yay! My name is Chris. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to present this to you today. We have a hashtag. After much experimentation, it will be art and tech in words. Down the bottom, use that in conjunction with the official hashtag. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, despite the accent, I've been living in Sydney, uh, working in the Australian tech industry for more than 15 years now. I've been a web developer, a business analyst, a, a people leader. Um, I'm an old school member of the Sydney Girl Geek chapter. I help organize the Sydney Technology Leaders Meetup. But like many of you, that's not really the whole story of who I am. This is me too. Um, I am an award-winning knitter, blue ribbon at the Easter show, yeah. Uh, I am a sewer, a sewer who makes a lot of my own clothes, including this thematically appropriate dress with pockets, yeah. Um, and I like to think an all-around sort of creative person. And so these are all projects I have made over the years that combine my love of art and tech. Uh, and the problem I have with most tech events is you don't see this stuff. Um, so for the non-locals, I work for Yao Conferences, which is an organization here that puts on a lot of in-depth tech events. So I see a lot of tech talks. I went to 124 meetups last year uh, and more than a dozen conferences. I see a lot of, here's what's new in this framework and here's how to use this particular technology, but I don't see this stuff. Um, I'm just really tired of it. And so last year in January in Hobart, um, I uh, went to my first LCA. I spoke about knitting and programming. Some of you may have seen at the Women of Open Technology mini conf um, and at the Open Hardware mini conf. And I found my people. I found all of you guys. And I was so excited about that. And then I saw the call for mini confs for 2018. And I was like, holy crap, I can curate a whole day of those folks talking about just the things that I find really exciting. Um, so today is uh, just a fantastic culmination of this dream over the last year. So I have a program for you. So keeping uh, with the LCA theme this year of a little bit of history repeating, we are going to hear some talks today um, from people who work with traditional arts like knitting and crochet and, and gluing bits of wood together, um, you know, things humans have been doing for thousands of years. But you're also going to hear from folks who are crafting things with new tools like neural networks and uh, 3D printers and Arduino. So just a quick overview. We're going to start with four talks all about software. Um, we've got the future of our uh, real-time animated landscapes with music. We've got whether a neural network can write a work of literature and creating digital sets for a big Hollywood blockbuster using fractals. Um, just a few notes on these four. So Jay's talk this morning, you heard us say, um, does include, you saw the signs, a, a little bit of nudity. It's LCA approved, um, but parental guidance recommended if anyone is under 13. I don't think we have. Uh, and Miles's talk, the, the, the fourth one there can't be recorded. So if you want to see the Gardens of the Galaxy talk, you got to be in this room. And then we move on to making physical things. Um, we've got hacking a knitting machine into a printer. We've got using 3D printing and IoT to solve real problems and the challenges facing a traditional artist in the world of tech. And then we end towards the end of the day, rushing forwards with a series of shorter talks. We've got some fun hobbyist lighting projects, hyperbolic geometry rendered in crochet, a uh, custom Raspberry Pi case um, that if you saw the exhibition yesterday, looks like an adorable tiny Mac, uh, and software that helps you generate cross-stitch charts. Um, a lot of these projects were shown at the exhibition yesterday, so if you missed it or you saw it and you wanted to hear more about it, good news, this is your chance. So that is a lot to get through. We have 11 talks, so I'm going to get straight into the very first one. Uh, and again, last chance. Okay, so um, I emailed the LC organizers about this issue, fun story, a, a few weeks back, and President Kathy Reed, who's here, uh, responded with this quote that I loved. She said, significant art is often contentious because it challenges who we are and the notions we hold of ourselves. Our job here is to allow that art to be shown while creating a safe environment for those who do and do not wish to view it. So I hope all of you here today are open to being challenged and that you find Jay's work as fascinating and beautiful as I do. So we'll get our first speaker up. So Jay Rosenbaum is an artist working with 3D modeling, augmented reality, and machine learning. Their work explores post-human and post-gender concepts using classical art combined with new media techniques and programming. Uh, they've recently finished a master's degree, congratulations, and changed focus to more technologically-based digital art using uh, physics-based rendering, deep neural networks, and Unity to develop augmented reality mobile apps. Some of you would have tried that out yesterday, videos and prints. Jay also has an exhibition happening at Midsummer in Melbourne right now, so very lucky to have Jay here. Please welcome Jay.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Who came to the A exhibition yesterday? Anyone? Yep. Awesome. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> so, um, as, uh, Chris has already given uh, my full introduction, so I think I can go straight into it. <laughs> um, tweet along. My um, uh, username is Minx Dragon on Twitter. The future is in machine learning, and that's not hyperbole. People are fearing losing their jobs to technology, to robot uprisings, and artificial intelligence changing their worlds. And I do see a changing of the world we live in. I think we're on the cusp of change. The way we work, no matter our industry, is going to be fundamentally altered. But this doesn't have to be a bad thing. Robots are not our evil overlords. They're our new best friends, our greatest collaborators. Machine learning is giving us the power to expand our horizons. The future of art is also in machine learning. Art is seen as an exclusively human avenue of self-expression, but uh, the art we're starting to produce with machine learning shows limitless potential for those willing to grasp it. A few years ago, if you'd asked me if I would be creating a machine learning and augmented reality-based artworks, I wouldn't, know, uh, wouldn't have known what you meant. But uh, telling me I'd be working with learning networks that could produce art with me, that's incredible. And mobile technologies that could show the truth behind the works. And now the technology moves so fast, it's almost blinding to keep up with. I'm obsessed with machine learning. For me, however, it's the art and the incredibly frivolous projects that really delight me. Janelle Shea is a wonderful example. Known for using neural networks to create paint samples and name pets, she also calls for crowdsourced input for her neural network's creations, whether it's Halloween costumes, knitting patterns, or the first line of your favorite novel. She feeds the data sets into her neural networks and watches as it learns for good or for evil. Janelle Shea works with TensorFlow and Torch using char RNN, character-based recurrent neural networks. Some successful recent projects include generating fish names and Halloween costumes. The real world weirdness of humanity seems to work especially well with the weirdness of neural networks. She's still calling for knitting based projects um, so you can submit them to her uh, Twitter or to um, her Tumblr account. Botnik is another fun viral example. They train predictive text keyboards on scripts, <laughs> advertising, and have people work with those keyboards to create entire show scripts. <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> Many of you have probably seen the Harry Potter one that's been going around. That's not been generated entirely by neural networks. It's generated using predictive text keyboards and people choosing what they want to choose, just like um, when you use the middle button on your, uh, on your um, mobile to make a fun sentence. So I've worked with Botnik. Anyone can join their Slack and become a contributor. And what's interesting about these is while the com content possibilities are driven by a computer, the humans are pulling the strings. Because all of this tech is available to anyone with a GitHub account and some understanding and patience, we're seeing the highbrow combined with the lowbrow, the sacred and profane, the serious and the ridiculous. I feel that this openness, this sharing, is what leads more and more to breakthroughs. Not only are we collaborating with our computers, but we're collaborating with people all over the world. Take Google Deep Dream. On its own, as a script, it's fascinating to computer scientists. It uses cellular style thinking to conceptualize what it sees and draws comparisons with things that's been taught. The images created by the professionals at Google Research Labs are something to behold. Each one gains in complexity the more it's put through the system and the more Deep Dream reinforces its own assumptions about an image. If Google had left it at that, if they'd released some of the images and showed what they were doing, people would be momentarily curious, but it wouldn't have gone beyond that. However, Google released the open source code and enabled everyone with the understanding to use it. Then developers released apps and created tools to allow lay people to create their own images with minimal understanding required. This collaboration is at the heart of cyber art. Deep Dream has become a tool used by millions to create disturbing imagery of their very own. 
This process, the sharing, the discussion around the images is part of the art, not necessarily just the works themselves, but the possibilities inherent in the concept of allowing a computer to dream psychedelic images of your work. Everyone has the power to create these images, just as everyone has the power to pick up a paintbrush or take up a camera. What they produce depends on their understanding and whether they use the standard options or work with the code to create something truly unique and startling. CyberArt can be a great equalizer. The tools are available to everyone, but what you do with it, that's the question. That's what transcends the work. Like all art, it's easy to start, but difficult to master. Nope. I love this frog. <laughs> This is one of my favorite things made with Deep Dream ever. Oh my uh. God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Deep Dream was a leader in the way we look at generative art and machine learning. It made machine learning an accessible visual thing for everyone to embrace. <laughs> There's the bus. <laughs> Deep Dream was the first snowball in an avalanche that started a lot of work in neural network imaging and art. A neural algorithm of artistic style by Gattis, Ecker, and Bethke is the seminal work on style transfer algorithms. Building on the capabilities of Deep Dream, but with the capacity to change one image into the style of any other. They're also the creators of the website deepart.io, where lay people can come and use their scripts in a web-friendly interface. Personally, I use a torch implementation of the concept called Neural Style by JC Johnson. It allows me to see every iterative stage and fine tune my own parameters to get the results I'm after. Style transfer has also been one of the focuses of the Magenta project by Google in TensorFlow. On the face of it, style transfer is a kitschy and basic concept, a pastiche as Magenta refers to it. Early into my research, I was asked what made it different to a fancy Photoshop filter. If you consider it in terms of the feed forward app Prisma, it's very similar to a, a Photoshop filter in many ways. A Photoshop filter is predictable, it's reliable. It's, the results have been fine-tuned to such a degree that everyone can use them effectively. In Prisma, the style images are curated so that the results always come out well. You can always tell a Prisma piece because there's so little variation in the results. But the difference is that style transfer algorithms break down the image into its components and rebuild it into something else entirely. It starts with comprehension, understanding the components that make up the image using an image classifier, then deconstruction, it breaks the image down into a more malleable state, and finally reconstruction, where the image is built back up using new components, incorporated with the understanding and comprehension of the previous two stages. And any fan of anime and Full Metal Alchemist would understand the principles of alchemy there. <laughs> Neural style is iterative, with multiple levels building on each other, reinforcing concepts and building on the stage before. Watching the iterations in an animation, you can see how the works evolve as they're broken down and rebuilt. Each work is new and different in some exciting way. With neural style, I can never say what the results are going to be or what will work best. As I progress in my machine learning research and knowledge, I'm improving all the time in selecting the best styles to transfer and the ideal parameters, even the better neural networks to run it through. But my first few attempts were disastrous. Encouraging, <laughs> but disastrous. And over time, I learned more and refined my processes further. Luckily, I document all my parameters and all of the processes for every step of the way so that I can recreate any image at any time. I can't say why one work will end up being more successful than the other. That's part of the mystery of art. Success, for me, isn't always in a perfect style transfer. Like art, I just know it when I see it. The most exciting moment, though, is when a, the neural network adds a color that isn't present in either the render by me or the style, used, uh, style image I used to define it. The unexpected and unpredicted outcome is fascinating because I look at the work as a whole, but the algorithm treats every pixel the same. They're all as valuable as the one adjacent. The deep purple here 
isn't present in the render or the Greek vase I used as a reference. It is an addition added purely by the computer. I know that it's probably the result of a color aberration in adjacent pixels that the computer singled out, but it chose that color. It decided to emphasize it, and that is when a piece becomes more successful to me. A splash of digital purple in a Greek vase-inspired work. That moment when I see something like a random color bloom, that is a moment I'm proud to be an artist working in this field. There's a sense of rightness of working collaboratively with my computer as an artist. We're seeing truly incredible works starting to emerge now thanks to generative adversarial networks. The artworks created are starting to fool people into believing they were created by hand. Rutger's Art and Artificial Intelligence Lab has created a paper discussing how they trained again with different painting styles to create a creative adversarial network, then put together a panel of people to compare and judge works made by humans for Miami Art Basel, which is the premier art fair in um, the US, contemporary art fair in the US, and the artworks uh, made by machines. So comparing artworks made by humans and artworks made by machines. In the end, users believed that 53% of the creative adversarial network images were made by people, as compared to only 35% of the generative adversarial network images and only 41% of the Art Basel works. Where things get interesting, however, is when respondents were asked to rate how intentional, visually structured, communicative and inspiring the images were. They rated the images generated by the computer as higher than those created by art real artists, whether in the abstract expressionism set or in the Art Basel set. What we're seeing here is art created by computers rated higher by humans than works created by hand. Imagine what we'll see when human artists embrace working with machines even more. Generative adversarial networks run in a similar way to artistic critiques or code reviews. A producer creates something and it is immediately critiqued by its adversary, like academia dialed up to 11. But neural networks don't have feelings, at least not yet. So we don't have to worry. This process is repeated over and over and the machine learns the best ways to produce work to fit the definition and criteria. In this way, we may discover more about what makes art, art. GANs are the very definition of, I know it when I see it. But without emotional or political bias, it can determine the artistic quality for itself. While in this way, we may learn more about the artistic process and development, we also run the risk of GAN producers restricting themselves too much. Like an artist who finds out that only one thing sells and produces nothing but that for the rest of their career. <coughs> Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> we need to strike a balance between encouraging inspiration while still allowing it to exist within the loose category of art. We stand on a new precipice of artistic discovery, as we did after Duchamp declared, the artist of the future will merely point his finger and say it is art, and it will be art. And while many disagreed and were outraged by his works, it heralded a new way of looking at art. We are yet again facing a new way to look at art and art creation. The primary platforms for creative development are CAFE from Berkeley AI Research, the benchmark source for many pre-trained models and training your own convolutional neural nets, and TensorFlow's Magenta program, which has a number of musical options in addition to its own style transfer. The idea of music being composed by an AI is easier to conceptualize in many ways than computer-generated visual art. Music is highly mathematical, with a series of absolute rules that can be programmed in. There are no such rules for visual art. Music is mathematical, it's al algorithmic. It's the essence of mathematics made human. So why do people have difficulty when listening to computer-generated music? We gain empathy with the performer of a piece, but the, compo the composition itself still follows the same rules. There was an episode of Star Trek Voyager where the hologram doctor was performing opera for aliens. This sounds uniquely far-fetched, but stay with me. The aliens had never heard music before, and they were overwhelmed with its beauty and its mathematical uh, implications. One started to compose her own work, and the doctor was duplicated, 
and his vocal capacity reprogrammed to fulfill the new requirements. All of the aliens loved the new composition, but the humans couldn't enjoy it. It was too alien. It was too different, too far from the constructed rules of music as we know it today. This is a piece I made in magenta um, based off of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I see AI-developed music like the music of the aliens. Many people are uncomfortable because it has the potential to move beyond what we know of music. We can program a neural net with the rules and forbid it to stray outside, and it will do passable new works that will echo some composers, but it won't really quite make it. Or we can dial up the imagination and allow the rules to be broken and see what new ideas form. The best music comes from knowing the rules and breaking them in interesting new ways. In art, any form of art, rules are made to be broken. Platforms like Amper, Watson and Magenta are allowing artists to collaborate with AI to create truly interesting work. Machine learning moves pretty quickly. And I believe if we can keep up with our collaborative partners, we'll create some truly outstanding things. I believe we still need a human vocalist at this stage, but one day music may surpass our physical abilities. With no programming knowledge whatsoever, we can use style transfer with deepart.io, create music with Amper, and create hallucinations with Deep Dream Generator. If that piques interest in the possibilities of machine learning and you have understanding of command line functions, then suddenly your world is open. You can install CAFE and Torch for style transfers and image training and recognition. You can install TensorFlow and Magenta to create music and style transfers and suddenly you have more control. Rather than just allowing a website to set the tone, you can create anything. And you can change the parameters to fulfill your own model of success. One of my favorite aspects of machine learning is when the tools to create are released into the wild. When the information is disseminated to the point where everyone can explore and create their own works. When AI leaves the lab and the internet gets involved. That's when exciting developments start happening. The trend I see over and over is when uh, the technology comes out and it goes viral, it's because people discuss how creepy it is, how grotesque. They see the silly and weird, and they're satisfied but not comforted, and they seek to learn more. And further development takes over, and artists become involved, and this previously creepy and silly technology moves into the realms of higher art. I love seeing the frivolous, creepy, and bizarre uses of machine learning because I feel that's where the greatest progress into human styles of thinking will be made. Puppy slug is the term given to the bizarre creatures that Google Deep Dream comes up with. A horrifying melange of psilocybin-induced critters with too many legs and dog heads with bird bodies and snail shells and eyeballs. Deep Dream was many people's introductions to machine learning, and they used it to create nightmarish selfies and food pictures. Most people online use the default convolutional neural net model Zoo. A CNN, a cafe model Zoo, sorry. A CNN can only use what it's trained on, and model Zoo is trained on animals. In fact, there are so many dogs and birds, especially, that it can't help but be reinforced. In a way, it's got confirmation bias. Is that a dog? Oh yeah, definitely, that's a dog, totally a dog. But like a dog with bug legs? It sees something in each layer and uh, confirms and builds on it. It's like a group of stoned people looking at clouds and agreeing with each other. It misses the big picture and only looks at the small parts and builds a story based on those sections. Style transfer, on the other hand, has resulted in a lot fewer people being horrified to look at their social media feeds. Some users have created truly excellent machine learning based artistic creations, like these dinosaurs made from fruit and flowers created by Chris Rodley. They were made using deepart.io and went viral earlier this year, introducing the concept of style transfer, oh, earlier last year rather, um, of style transfer to thousands who've never heard of it before. The works were made by crossing a book on flowers or a book on fruit with a book on dinosaurs and successfully carry the essence of both across. They both exist in synchronicity together. Reddit users have found this style transfer more unsettling. It's of Napoleon crossing the Alps and is highly successful, 
but has also been hailed as highly creepy due to every element being comprised of unexpected fabric folds. This is one of my hands down favorite things. It's a ca Christmas carol composed last year by showing a recurrent neural net a picture. The internet blew up with tales of its creepiness and proof of how AI is gonna murder all humans. But this was an independent creation by a machine after being inspired by a picture. It's a reaction to a stimulus to create something. It has some issues. It interpreted the decorations on the tree as flowers, but there's glimmerings of Christmas sentiment around the edges. The synthesized voice is probably the biggest impediment to the empathy behind the project. This work was created in Berkeley AI Labs as part of their Neural Karaoke project and as part of a greater project involving composition of pop music and story singing such as this. The reaction to this is almost as fun as the work itself and that's part of the controversy in machine learning based art. The online nature of the work opens it up to response and the response becomes part of the work. Apps such as FaceApp are a fascinating look into mobile-based applications of machine learning. They're frivolous use, to be sure, driven by selfie culture, but they provide insight into notions of beauty with the spark setting, gender swapping, aging, and the forced smile. They go beyond Snapchat filters and Photoshop morphs to fundamentally change aspects of the face and create as seamless an experience as possible. Sadly, I don't know as much about FaceApp's underpinnings as I'd like. The speculation is, is that it uses a, con a, a conditional generative adversarial network. And I've surmised, based on lots of testing, that its main data set is CelebNet. But unfortunately, that's it. I'd like to, a chance to go further with the code and implement some of my own ideas. I've played extensively with it as it is, but to be able to investigate the technology behind it and use it beyond the mobile app environment would be wonderful. The results from FaceApp that have gone viral have been toys, statues, and paintings, and people seem to be grossed out by the app forcing a smile onto faces. But if you look to how it attempts to match the style as well as the smile, you'll see how it really starts to become successful. Mug Life is the latest facial manipulation app provided by NVIDIA. An attempt to make a 3D meme GIF generator. It uses machine learning to detect facial data, then create a mesh with your photograph as an overlaid texture. From there, you can manipulate it yourself or use the preset animations. It was trained using CUDNN to analyze photos and understand the components that go into a photograph of a face the lighting, the features, and the texture. Using that data, it's able to identify facial features and overlay the 3D mesh to enable warping and animation. So yay. <laughs> On the face of it, it's a really silly concept. The user interface and meme content do not inspire confidence in the back end. It works well on subtle animations, but not very well on large ones. But the technology behind it is exceptionally cool. There's a lot going on beneath, behind the seemingly banal interface. So here, you can see that one of them is a lot more successful than the other one. But just like with FaceApp, MugLife works particularly well bringing art to life. <laughs> <laughs> The exaggeration and ridiculousness work particularly well in this scale. I don't have any artistic applications for this yet, but it's only been out for, you know, a couple of months. This one's my favorite though. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to have my very first fail with mug life. I find that anything involving machine learning, the fails are almost as interesting as the successes. <laughs> this is a photograph a friend took of a statuette of baby Jesus. The mesh applied poorly in this case due to the angle of the face, and somehow the mouth has ended up in the neck to create a gaping maw. The text is supposed to say, you mad bro, 
But for some reason, the text also failed, creating this bizarre simlish. This one gift gave me so much hope for this app. <laughs> pix to pix is another machine learning application that has gone from creepy to wondrous. pix to pix uses conditional adversarial networks and is set up to translate images from one thing to another. That may be using style transfer, colorizing black and white images, changing day to night, generating a city from a map. It can also synthesize high quality photographic images from semantic label maps. But that isn't what it's best known for. Although this is game-changing technology, it's best known for filling in sketches with photographic data. This last example went viral <laughs> when a web interface for the system went up for everyone to sketch cats and shoes and handbags. There was even a brief portrait one which has sadly been taken down. Again, like Deep Dream, everyone responded to the creepiness the horrible things that could be made and shared around to laugh at, and it is so much fun to play with. But where many see a creepy and short-lived option for entertainment and nightmare fuel, artists such as Patrick Tressett are seeing the possibilities for high-end art. This GIF is from Patrick's work with pix to pix training his own conditional adversarial network in a series of sketches produced by robots during an installation and the photographs of people sitting for their portrait. He then produced a sketch, submitted the video to the can, and we can see the effect. The result is otherworldly, almost painterly. With a decidedly digital feel, it takes on a sense of evolution. This is an example of taking something that no one expected to have any artistic merit and, uh, 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 excuse me, and exploring the high-end artistic possibilities. Each work is a unique thing. But viewed together as a progression, it is a new expression of a collaboration between human and algorithm. Turkish painter and illustrator C.M. Kozman and PhD computer science student Roloff Peters teamed up together to run Kozman's surreal demonic images through Deep Dream. The works were called demonic imagery from medieval texts. Far from creating demonic imagery itself, Kozman's theory is that it works off the same data as we do and has summoned the images for itself based on that knowledge. Mike Tyker is one of the better known artists working with machine learning. These Deep Dream Inceptionism works were created using random noise and neural networks trained on patterns and cities by the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Since creating these works, Tyker has been working on his series, Portraits of Imaginary People. First, using deep dream style backpropagation approaches, he then moves into generative adversarial networks. He uses a deep convolutional generative adversarial network to generate faces on a tiny scale, and then a stack GAN to upsample different parts of the images to, according to a generated face map. And he merges them together in a higher resolution format. This tiling technique uses similar technologies to pix to pix in its uh, texturing. And the final result is breathtaking. This is just a small sample. The faces are human, yet otherworldly, with a painterly aspect to the texture that gives them a sense of soul. Now, bear in mind the results of Mike Tyker's work, created in June last year, and look at these portraits created by NVIDIA in October. They also use generative adversarial networks and the full weight of NVIDIA's research team. They're made for different ends, but these are generated celebrity images. They do not exist. This is how staggeringly fast the technology is moving. It's incredible, but does it have the same emotional impact as Mike Tyker's works? Of the Tresset video, I realize these aren't supposed to be artistic and therefore they're not supposed to have an emotional reaction, but we need to consider the why, even when looking at technology like this. What purpose does it serve? Tyker's portraits received complaints of Uncanny Valley, but I've seen no such result, uh, response to the Celebe images. Why is that? Is it an emotional reaction and therefore a key element of the artistic process? Is it necessary? I admit I don't feel or notice Uncanny Valley, so I've done what any normal nerd does when confronted with something I don't understand and researched it extensively. 
People have mentioned it in regards to my work. In fact, one professor during my master's actually had to sit down. She was so discomforted by my paces. <laughs> Uncanny Valley has ruined box offices with people complaining about movies like Final Fantasy and The Polar Express. It has become a thing to move away from without examining enough of the why and how it works. I argue that if we move too far away from it, we get emotionless works like the celeb A pieces. They may be very proficient, but not emotionally charged. Artists always need to consider engagement with their works, whether positive or negative, we need to have a reaction. We need to engage the viewer. Digital art can run the risk of being too sanitized in the fear of Uncanny Valley and therefore lose engagement, lose that hook that draws the viewer's eye. An artwork without emotion is no art. Is a work that exists on a computer still an artwork? If we can see it on our screens rather than explore it in a museum or a gallery, do we feel it's real? Where is the art? Is the art in the code? Is it in the screen? Or does it only exist when it's printed? Do people see more value in a work where they can see the medium used, where they can see the texture and the brush strokes and the touch of a human hand? Do we dismiss things on the screen more often than not? Does something exist more when printed, when painted, when sculpted? Do we conflate our screen exposure so that all digital experiences are given equal weight? What if the work, the next Rembrandt, created entirely by computer? The work was produced by code that utilized deep learning to analyze every known Rembrandt painting until it came up with a perfect collection of characteristics that made up a Rembrandt portrait, from the gender to the posing to the lighting. The computer then sampled and processed the details to, com create, uh, to create an entirely new work based on the previous works of Rembrandt of a person who's never actually existed. If this was where the painting stopped, then it may have been dismissed, but the work was then taken further to produce a topographical plan based around Rembrandt's specific paint application style and was 3D printed in textured and layered inks. Is this a more valid work by this rationale? As it exists in a painted tangible form with texture, is it more real somehow than works that exist purely on a computer? This is an issue I grappled with as I created my recursion project. I wanted something physical, but also something entirely digital, an aesthetic display for gallery hanging, but an exploration of machine learning and an analysis of post-gender concepts in a digital space. For me, augmented reality was the solution, allowing me to bridge those worlds. I craft 3D models in DAS 3D and Blender. The works were rendered in the Lux Render, which is a physics-based render engine. And I used lighting based off photographic rigs to create the environmental lighting I needed, tailoring the materials to get the most realistic renders possible. From there, I take the final render with the original inspiration behind the work, such as archeological artifacts, paintings, things I turn up in my research, and I use neural style to create a machine learning based interpretation of that work. The simplicity of the interaction shouldn't detract from what it is. When you hold your phone up to a piece, the work fundamentally changes. And when seen with its partner fretwork, where it begins from an abstract space and loops back to the original render, you start to gain an idea for the notion of transition. I didn't want to create a work on transness where the figures transition figured, uh, fig, uh, physically. Excuse me. This work is not about that. It's about being who you are how your inspirations and the things you see become part of you, and how when you look at yourself, you see parts of everything you've consumed visually coming together. And that is why machine learning is such a wonderful tool for artists to use. Because everything we absorb ends up in our work, knowingly or unknowingly, we train our minds and spit out the results. Some are resolved and well executed, and some are gibberish. But our work is the product of what we absorb. Interneural networks and the ability to train it in specifics, art from a given time, pictures of flowers, colors, shapes, faces, smiles, and we gain the power to collaborate with the computer in incredible ways. The questions that arise when looking at these works is can computers create art? Are these works digital art or a flash in the pan? Are they merely a kitsch development of some cool code or a new way to look at the way art is made? Where does the art lie in these works? Is it in the collaboration, the code, and the works that are produced? Many art forms are similar. They rely on the artist to control as many of the variables as possible while maintaining the freedom to allow the work to take shape. 
When the brush in this case is an algorithm run by a computer accessing the sum total of a neural network's knowledge, then the output is chaotic to be sure, but still able to be controlled through knowledge and expertise. An artist working with these tools still has to learn to use them effectively to produce something unique, just as a painter or a photographer would. As the old programming axiom goes, garbage in, garbage out. Neural networks at their heart <laughs> are mimesis. They're an imitation of the human brain developed to think like ours and make connections. The truly, a truly disturbing thing about it may be that we don't want to acknowledge that it is getting closer to the way we process thoughts and images. Whether mimicking the style of artists, hallucinating strange beasts, or creating a person we've never seen before, computers are drawing ever closer to mimicking the way we create art, to duplicating the styles made by human hands and the connections we see. We appear to be drawing ever closer to replicating the way artists view the world. If we can replicate that, we can work towards duplicating the processes in digital art and using those methods to augment our own works. Because when an artist is combined with an artistic computer, the possibilities inherent outweigh the capabilities of each individually. I believe there's space for the ridiculous frivolity of face app selfies, as well as the beauty and surprising complex structure of the Taika works. There's room for artists to collaborate with, computer, with code to create something um, or for the machines to do all the heavy lifting from nothing at all. The difference is in the intention. If the intent is to horrify or amuse, the power is there. If the intent is to horrify, it's also there. The algorithm treats them all the same. It can't tell a cat from a Kandinsky. In this way, the internet is an equalizer. The algorithms are equalizers, and anyone with the capability can produce works with this code. They can share them, disseminate them, share the code, print them to sell, or give them away as free viral fodder. Machine learning has the capacity to inspire, to fuel our work in amazing ways if only we let it. And in turn, we can seed that garden ourselves and watch the inspiration grow for others. Thank you. We do have a few moments for questions, if anyone has a question for Jay. Hi. Hi. Um, We've got a mic. <laughs> oh, awesome. It's not so much a question as a request, because um, you had that somewhere over the magenta. Yes. Is it possible to hear that? Um, it is. I can, I'll link it up on Twitter. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Cool. No problem. <laughs> cool. cool. I, <clears throat> forgive me again, not a question. I've <laughs> just observed that with auto tune and speech synthesis, synthesis, yeah, synthesis <laughs> and uh, bands like the Arctic Monkeys, where you that there is no sort of obvious human band there. Mm. I don't think we're that far from a completely virtual artist. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. Just going to get the next speaker. Yep. Like yeah, 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 please. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Anyone? Up. Oh. Um, what does this mean for copyright? Uh, <laughs> I've been asked that a couple of times, and it's really interesting because we're seeing um, some things change with, um, with copyright, it, it, like um, with the monkey selfie and the court case that came out with that. It's fascinating to see. I think that we're going to see more coming out in the future. At, as it stands at the moment, um, the images that are used in training a neural net aren't considered to be in breach of copyright because they're unrecognizable in the output. Um, and then the artist who's programming it has the, um, keeps the copyright there. It is nice if they give credit to the repo and everything, of course. Um, that's the current state of the land in copyright, but it may change in the future. Thanks. Um, you were, with the uh, celebrity image that you said did yes. trigger people's uncanny valley, do you think that might be because there's already a degree of an uncanniness and dehumanisation in the way we look at celebrities? 
Yes, I do. I have, I have a thing on that, actually, um, because the way we view um, Photoshop and things like that has really changed the way we look at people. And so a lot of CG artists put flaws into works deliberately to offset the Uncanny Valley effect. But um, artists are trying to... Um, uh, but of course, we're used to seeing these very homogenized images. And so there's a disconnect now in seeing the flawed images versus the homogenized ones. Um, and there are articles out there about Uncanny Valley in relation to Photoshopped uh, based celebrity images. Um, I think it's a fascinating area. Hi. Hi. Um, there was recently a, someone who um, stitched celebrity faces onto videos of porn. Mm, yeah. I was wondering what you thought about what the limits and the restrictions on things like that should be. That's a whole other talk, I think. Um, there's a, I've, I've really been looking into that because the ethics behind it are amazing. It, it, does, it uses um, machine learning, and there's also been um, some use of Barack Obama's image there. We're going to need to um, have greater laws around our, um, our own image and how we govern it. And that's important for privacy laws anyway. Um, and then we're going to need um, ethics in terms of machine learning because there are so many people who go, oh, I can do this. That means I should do this. Whereas maybe there needs to be more thinking of just because I can, does that really mean that I should? Is this an ethical thing to do? And it's, it's a real dilemma that a lot of people are um, a lot of people who probably know more about it are, uh, than I are going on about it, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a lot of uh, stuff that gets talked about. Hi, over here. Oh, oh over here. Sorry, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, both the art world and the tech world are currently looking at all of this as basically identity porn and mm. personhood porn. Where do you think this is going? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that we're going to be creating artificial people um, and that's going to be skewing the demographic in a way. We're going to be um, changing the way we view person. Uh, we're already changing the way we view personhood and obviously our governments are and everything. Um, so I think that it's going to fundamentally change how personhood is defined and considered. Just one more. Mm. somewhere else, actually, this question. Um, at the IEEE Sections Congress this year, there was a, a band where the, the drums had been completely um, um, instrumented, mm -hmm. to, to use a better word, uh, where the, the, the kids played, the young people played the music and the, the AI worked out what the drum should be yes. from their music. And they realised after they'd done that project that they had it back to front, that oh. really... The drumming actually sets the tempo and pace of the music rather than the Absolutely. other way around. So have you got any thoughts about how to um, get things like that the right way around? Well, uh, they could do it with a drum track um, set and then, um, you know, where, where the drummers are the musicians and then the AI riffs off of that. Um, but, I mean, it... it um, in, in a well-organised orchestra, you don't need the, um, or a band, you don't need the drum to set the tone because you already know where it's going to be coming out. Um, but it does help. <laughs> um, I think that we're going to be seeing um, more, in terms of uh, music created on its own is still very much in its infancy. But I think that we're going to be seeing more riffing off of music in the, in the future and using AIs to harmonise and to um, collaborate in that regard. Please join me in thanking Jay for that wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs>